Hello, everybody. Good evening. Welcome back to our Shangsheng UK lecture series. And um, thank you for joining us. I see lots of new faces, and it's quite a bunch of us tonight. So let me tell you just a couple of words about our Shangsheng Institute UK. Some of you might know us already, but we're organizing cultural events and talks. And this is our monthly seminar uh, to do with Tibetan culture, history, literature. So it's a great pleasure to welcome Adam Piercy tonight and Dr. Agam Piercy, I must say. And he has a wonderful website called Lotsawa House, which has translation of Tibetan texts and uh, by great masters, including many by uh, Jamyang Chukilodro, who we'll be hearing about tonight. Actually, last month's talk was about his previous uh, incarnation, Jamyang Kyantse Wangpo, so it's a very nice um, succession, a follow-up. You're welcome to see uh, the talk which was given by Casey Kemp from Cancer Vision Project last month. It's up on our YouTube channel, so maybe after this talk, if you're interested in, to know more about the context, you can check it out on there, on our Shangshung UK YouTube channel. Anyway, I don't want to say too much. I'll leave Adam to give his talk. I'm sure it'll be great. And Adam, please do tell us more about your website, uh, maybe at the end of your talk or whenever you feel appropriate. And if we have questions, uh, you can write them in the chat or keep them until the end. The talk will last about an hour or so, and or a little bit more, whatever you want, Adam. We have no time pressure. And then we'll have some questions at the end. So thank you, everybody, for joining us. And thank you so much, Adam, for being he here tonight. Thank you, Jeremy. I, I think it will maybe be less than an hour, but we'll see. And um, I will mention the website um, probably uh, many times. Okay, I'll share my screen, I hope. Let me see if I can do that. Okay. Um, is that working okay? I, yeah. All right, so today um, I'm going to talk about Jamin Kinsey Chukilodro, who has been called by Tukatunda Brahmaji the greatest master of many lineages of the 20th century. So I'll begin by giving a brief overview of his life. Uh, then I'll say a little about his writings, uh, first as they exist in Tibetan, and then a little about existing translations, and especially our project to uh, at Lotso House, which is now in its uh, third year of translating some of these writings. And then I'll give a few examples uh, of texts that have been translated during this first phase of our project. So when talking about the life of German Kinsey Chukilodra, we obviously we know quite a lot about his life um, compared to the lives of many other masters um, because he lived relatively recently. Um, we have multiple sources, including his biographies, the secret biography, diaries, um, information in the colophons of his texts, as well as secondary literature uh, and so on. And this, as Jeming said already, is uh, following on from Casey's talk last month uh, on the Kinsey Vision Project. Um, she mentioned then the fact that Jeming Kinsey Wampo had multiple reincarnations, and uh, these were associated with uh, enlightened body, speech, mind, qualities, activity. And um, Jeming Kinsey was recognized as an activity emanation. He was born in 1893. Uh, which is a, just a year after Jemin Kinsey Wampo had passed away. Uh, some sources, uh, even modern sources, give the year of his birth as 1896, um, but that's an error. Uh, and that uh, mistake appears to have originated in a book by Ariane MacDonald on the Manjushri Mula Kalpa Mandala, in, published in 1960. Um, although even in there, she says that uh, 1893 was the date. It, it's just there was a mistake in a chart in that book, uh, which was then copied in another chart uh, that appeared in an introduction by Gene Smith, and then was copied by scholars after that, uh, and then continues to be um, to this day. But it was 1893, and from around 1900, 
Uh, he was educated at Katok, uh, the major Nyingma monastery of Katok, uh, where he was assigned as a tutor, uh, Kembo Tupten Rigzin, who um, had been the, the tutor of his, his uh, teacher, Katok Situ. Um, so Katok Situ gave his own tutor, who at that time was quite old and was quite unwell. And so between the age of about 10 and 13, Jamin Kinsa Chukadadra had to uh, care for this tutor who was who was dying. Uh, and this was quite a formative experience for Kinsa Chukadadra, as he says in his autobiography. He says, in my 13th year, my gracious tutor passed to a pure realm and left me stranded like a child alone in the desert or a blind person lost and without a guide. For three years, my noble tutor suffered continuously with phlegmatic sickness Throughout this time, I put aside my own concerns and served as his attendant. Tirelessly, I made tea, fetched water, nursed him, and so on, all of which I believed helped to purify some of my obscurations. Then, uh, as many as you, of you will know, um, following the death of uh, Jemin Chiki Wangpo, who was the main um, body incarnation of Jemin Kinsi Wangpo at uh, Zongsa, which is a Sekya monastery, uh, in 1908. Uh, Jemin Kinsey Chikilera was brought to Zongsa in 1909 by Katok Situ. And there was some opposition um, to this move at Zongsa. And uh, one of the effects of this, according to his disciples, was that uh, Jemin Kinsey Chikilera was forced to sort of prove himself in a sense. In other words, he had to learn a great deal very quickly. Uh, and in his autobiography, he says, during my 15th year, the incarnation from Zongsa departed for another realm. And according to the final testament of our predecessor's ailing nephew, as transmitted to Katok Situ, I, a sack of squandered offerings, which is how he refers to himself um, several times in his writings, had to move to the main seat, Zongsa. Everyone left me and all alone I had to take charge independently. As a result of past negative karma, some were unfriendly and hostile toward me, but through the discipline of avoiding arrogance, I ensured that the seat was not lost. By adopting an attitude of great loving kindness, I pacified hostility in one people's hearts. So just as an aside, there's some parallel here with, you could say, I think, with the life of Zhang Gong Kongtrul, who also encountered some kind of um, sectarian and political kind of uh, uh, sort of rivalry in his youth, and that became a formative experience. You could say that this was a formative experience in, the, in a similar way for Kinsey Chugi Lodra. Uh, Kensi Chikilodra had um, many teachers. Uh, he says in his autobiography, more than 80, um, but it's clear from his writings that he felt six in particular were the most important. Uh, these were the ones you can see there. Jemming uh, Lote Wampo, Katok Situ Chiki Jatso, Shishin Jatso, Azum Drupa, Drup Chenji Mitempinima, and Gatangawang Lepa. These were all direct disciples of Jemming Kensi Wampo. They mainly represent uh, the Nyingma and the Sakya schools, uh, but he also had uh, teachers from other traditions. And for example, his main Gelukpa teacher was uh, Amdogeshi Jamparu Lodro, who you see there. Um, and an important part of Kensi Chikilura's education was taking monastic vows at Minjuling Monastery, just as Jemin Kensi Wangpo had done, which happened in uh, 1925. He also received all the major collections that have been compiled by uh, Jemin Kinsey Wampo, Jangon Kongtrul, Jemin Lote Wampo, which Casey talked about last month, as well as the reading transmissions for the Kanja, the Tenja, and so on. Uh, one of his most important achievements certainly was the founding of the Scriptural College, uh, or Shedra, at Zongsa Monastery, which was known as Kamje or Kamshe Shedra. And this is um, a not very great quality image of um, the, the re rebuilt Zongsa Shedra as it is today. Uh, so this he founded in uh, the original in 1918, um, and this would become a major center for education for Saki scholars and produced Kempos uh, with a great reputation for learning as well as meditative attainment. And uh, many of whom went on to found other Shedra or study colleges of their own elsewhere. So he talked about this in his autobiography by saying, in the earth horse year when I was 25, I established the great Dharma teaching center of Shedra Dajeling, that is Kamje Shedra, 
And through the magnanimous, magnanimous aspirations of Kenshin Shimpen Jampe Kocha, which is Kempo Shenga, who I'm sure many of you have heard of, it has continued without decline until the present. In this way, I was of some slight benefit to the teachings. So Jemin Kinsey Chicken Lotus spent a lot of time in, in meditative retreat. Uh, he established a routine whereby he would uh, remain in retreat um, virtually every winter. And in this way, he was able to accumulate all the mantras connected with the vast number of deity practices. Uh, he does mention this in his autobiography, but he does it in a, a modest way and says, although I wish to practice approach and accomplishment for the three root deities of the new and old schools and karma and tema traditions, as desperately as someone afflicted with thirst would yearn for water, still I have been overwhelmed by the eight worldly concerns. And after listing the extraordinary number of mantras and practices he accumulated, he had accumulated by that time, I mean, he went on and did more. Um, this was not the very end of his life that he wrote this autobiography. He says, all this was done as in the statement, with a mind that's distracted, however much you recite, it will bear no fruit. I didn't gain Six even million. so much as a sign of common accomplishment. We have two hundreds now. 6.2 million. Okay. Um, still, as long as death doesn't catch up with me, I shall practice a little more approach and accomplishment so that I may gain accomplishment in this way. Lord of Odiana, grant me inspiration and blessing, I pray. So in the late 1940s, when he was around uh, 55 years old, Jemin Kinsey Chicken Lodger fell sick. And um, we don't, I, I, I don't know, I don't know if anyone knows the nature of the illness. But we do know that some disciples suggested he should take a spiritual wife or a consort to improve his health and extend his life. And this was controversial, as we can see from the letters that he wrote at the time. But he did mar marry Kendra Tsering Chudron, who was around 19 years old, uh, I think in 1948. In 1955, when he was 63, uh, Jemin Kinsey left Zongsa Monastery. Uh, he said that he was going on pilgrimage to Thassa. Uh, Alex Zenkarumche, who is the um, main advisor on our translation project at Lotsawa House, was there at Zongsa on that day and remembers it very well. The intention was to escape the worsening political situation in eastern Tibet. Uh, the journey took several months and the party visited major monasteries along the way. For example, in 1956, they arrived at Sopu Monastery where they met the 16th Kamapa. And in Lhasa, they met, uh, they visited the Dalai Lama several times and uh, went on to visit the pilgrimage places, the major pilgrimage sites around Lhasa. And then Jemin Kinsey Chikalodra went on to Sakya and eventually crossed over the Himalayas into Sikkim. And of course, Sikkim at that time was an independent kingdom and he became a special guest of the royal family there. Uh, almost as soon as he arrived, uh, the first time he he, he left um, on pilgrimage to the, the major sites of India and Nepal. And during this pilgrimage, he, he composed praises of almost every site that he visited um, in India and Nepal. For the final two years of his life, he was based at Gangtok in the Royal Chapel, or what's sometimes called the Palace Monastery. Uh, but he traveled to Darjeeling in the summer of um, 1958 in order to escape the, the heat of, of Gangtok. Uh, Darjeeling is slightly cooler. And uh, he passed away in the Royal Chapel in Gangtok in, uh, on the 12th of June in 1959. And people reported seeing uh, strange lights in the sky and other phenomena at that time, both in Gangtok and in uh, Zongsa in Tibet. There were months of ceremonies after this, and his cremation eventually took place uh, on the hilltop at the sacred site of Tashiding in Sikkim. So this is just a, a rough outline. Uh, there's plenty of material out there, as I said, um, already in, in translation for people who want to read more uh, if they're interested. So first and foremost, the, the main uh, biography by Dingo Kinsirimche, which was published uh, in 2017 as The Life and Times of German Kinsey Chukulodra. And this also includes uh, stories um, by Ogin Tokyo Rimche. Uh, there's also the autobiography that I've, 
I've been um, quoting from, which is available on Lots Our House. It's called The Play of Illusion. I mean, in fact, there's there's more than one autobiography. That's the verse autobiography. We also have a, another short prose autobiography that he wrote uh, as part of a, a histories for a particular practice. And um, there's also the, the biography in Tukatundra Rinpoche's Masters of Meditation and Miracles. And you also find references to Jemmy Kinsichukulodro, as many of you know, uh, no doubt in um, Dinga Kinsa Rinpoche's own autobiography, which is um, published as Brilliant Moon. Uh, there you can learn about his apparent fear of mice, for example. And um, there are uh, references in um, David Jackson's Saint in Seattle on the life of Dejun Rimshe, and also in um, Chogyan Namkonova's The Lamp That Enlightens Narrow Minds, as well as um, Sogyan Rimshe's The Tibetan Book of Living and Dying. So just a, a few points to note then. Um, it was said, um, I'm sure, last week, uh, last month by Casey that um, one feature of the life of Jamin Kenzi Wampo is that he had an extraordinarily large number of teachers, and more than 150, it's, it's said. And that's a major feature of his life and his biography. And you could say Jamin Kenzi Chikilodo also had uh, a large number of teachers, certainly, as we said, more than 80 is large, a large number of, of teachers. Uh, but uh, perhaps more extraordinary is the number of students that he had. So um, I don't have a figure, but he certainly had an extraordinarily large number of students. And it was his responsibility, amongst others, to give the empowerments, the transmissions for the major collections that, that uh, Casey was talking about that had been compiled by Jemin Kinsey Wampo, Jem Gong Kongtro, Jemmy Lotte Wampo, and so on. Things like the Dangak the Treasury of Instructions, uh, the Rin Chin Tedza, the Treasury of uh, Precious Terma Revelations, and so on. And he gave these uh, major transmissions several times. Uh, and this is mentioned at the end of his autobiography, which, I, as I've said, wasn't at the very end of his life. So there he, he discusses the number of times he gave these transmissions and so on. It's also discussed in Dingo Kien uh biography. Uh, so he traveled through Tibet. This gave him the opportunity to, to meet um, people, to, to uh, gain students, if you like. And then in exile, he also had uh, the opportunity to to meet um, students and pass on these teachings and these empowerments, these transmissions. So this is another kind of important feature of his life. Well, you could say, well, Jam Gong Control, uh, Lord Ritai and Jam Jem Kinsey Wampo's responsibility was, was mainly, mainly compiling these collections and transmitting them initially. It was subsequent generations who had the responsibility to continue that, to pass them on more widely and repeatedly. The collections at this point obviously already existed. And Kenzi Chiki Lodro, he wrote some minor texts as supplements, but that wasn't his main responsibility. His responsibility was in transmission, not in compilation, you could say. And another thing I, I think might be important to bear in mind is that uh, when you think of what is now a series of Kensei incarnations. Uh, you know, we have Kensei Wampo, then Kensei Chikilodro, then a Lama like Zonsa Kensei Rinpoche at the, at the moment. You might think of these as representing successive generations, first generation, second generation, third generation. But, you know, it's actually more complicated than that because uh, in generational terms, you, you have to say that Kensei Wampo was the first generation and Kensei Chikilodro was the third. And Zongso Kensei Rinpoche now, for example, is the fifth. Um, the incarnations don't overlap. They never meet one another. And in between, you have the senior students whose responsibility it is to pass on what they've received to the next generation. So this means that the, it was the direct students of German Kensei Wampo who were the second generation. And the students of Kensei Chiki Lodra represent the fourth generation. For example, Katok Situ um, was one of the most important figures in the second generation. He was uh, the, the nephew of Jemin Kensi Wampo. He was one of the main students. And he was one of Jemin Kensi Chikilodra's main teachers, if not his main teacher. 
what makes this slightly more complicated is um, Dingo Kinsirimji, who actually, according to this reckoning, would belong to both the third and the fourth generations. Because he was, like Jamin Kinsi Chukilodra, he was recognized as an incarnation of Jamin Kinsi Wampo, but he was 17 years younger than Jamin Kinsi Chukilodra. And he was, you could say, one of, if not the main student of Jamin Kinsi Chukilodra, and it was his role then to pass on what he received to the next generation. So I'll come back to this point. Uh, I apologize if that seemed unnecessarily complicated. Um, Okay, on to the writings. So to date, there have been three different collections of Jamin Kinsey Chukiloder's writings published in Tibetan. And the, the key bit of information here probably is the, the column with volumes. So you can see that the, the first edition, which was published in the 1960s, uh, and the name translates as something like miscellaneous writings, the Sung Torbu, was two volumes. Um, so this was uh, a woodblock print. Uh, unfortunately, it's only available now to me, at least, on, on a BDRC website. And the scans are in places completely, I mean, it says barely legible, completely illegible. And some pages are even missing. This is unfortunate. Um, the second edition published in the early 1980s was in eight volumes. Um, this, for, for those who understand um, this reference, this is mainly an Ume script, but um, the eighth volume, which is the secret biography, uh, is not. That was the secret biography compiled by uh, Kempo Kunga Wangchuk is the eighth volume. Uh, then most recently in 2012, you have um, a 12 volume edition and obviously the intention with the 12 volume edition, I think, was to supersede all the earlier editions. Unfortunately, it doesn't, um, because some of the texts that are in the earlier editions are not in the 2012 edition, in spite of the fact that it's um, got more than a thousand texts and is 12 volumes. Uh, and also, unfortunately, it's, it's introduced some new errors, which, you know, we have to look back at the earlier editions to deal with. Then, you also have um, here what's not been published, but what I'm referring to is new discoveries. So the, the people who compiled the, the 2012 edition, they're aware of five other texts that have come to light since 2012, um, fairly major discoveries. Uh, and they would of course be included in any future edition. And we do have access to them electronically, but you know they haven't been published um, in any other form. Okay, what you see on your screen is the uh, translation, as it appears on the House, of Bingo Kinsir MJ's catalogue to the first two-volume edition. So, as as we said, this is uh, early 1960s, soon after German Kinsir passed away in 1959, work began to compile this. Uh, so, in this catalogue, um, Bingo Kinsir MJ explains that um, Jemin Kinsey Chikiludra had already composed several volumes of writings in Tibet, but neither he nor those who accompanied him uh, on his travels could bring them all with them. So what, what this first two-volume um, set of writings included was mainly what he composed on his travels, the shorter texts, uh, the shorter writings that he composed um, between 1955 and 1959. And uh, this, this is indeed the case. If you look, I mean, obviously they brought some things that he'd composed earlier with them, um, but the majority of texts in that collection were composed uh, between 1955 and 1959, and they are uh, quite short. Then, so we know from this catalog that it was... Uh, Kendra Tsering Children, the, the consort of German Kinsey Chikiludra, who requested Dingo Kinsey Ramche not only to write the biography, but to compile his writings and oversee the publication of them. And as Dingo Kinsey Ramche says, this meant that disciples had to provide copies that they might have had in their possession. And at the same time, they had some pages that, that, that they copied, handwritten notes and so on, and they collected it all together and they edited it and they proofread it and they arranged it thematically. And one of the most 
you could say, uh, interesting but also touching aspects of this catalog is the detailed list of the people who contributed financially to support the publication. Uh, for example, Dinga Kinsirimchi says that the Dalai Lama himself offered 500 Indian rupees towards this. But uh, perhaps most touching of all is the contribution of Purbudroma, a Bhutanese nun who offered 20 rupees, he says. And another unnamed nun, also from Bhutan, who offered five rupees towards this. In the catalogue, Dinga Kinsirimchi explains the structure of the collection in, in rather ornate language, which is not unusual for this kind of literature, um, where a simple index would be far too prosaic. So he says, as to the contents, the first volume, which bears the sign of A, so A Vam, two volumes, A and then Vam, the first volume includes the autobiography, um, the sublime autobiography, which engenders com uh, confidence, collection of praises, delighting all the victorious ones and increasing the splendor of the two accumulations, collection of supplications like dancing clouds filled with the nectar of blessings and longevity prayers, vagal words of truth for bringing about immortality. So guru yoga practices, which grant the supreme experience of wisdom nectar, a collection of sadhanas, like a store of all the attainments that could be wished for, a collection of practical guides and instructional notes refining the essential nectar of profound meaning. And then the second volume, bearing the sign of Vam, includes a collection of advice, like garlanded beams of nectar from the moon of universal benefit, a collection of songs, which is a secret treasury of spontaneous Vajagiti, a collection of petitionary offerings to the Dharma protectors or Dharma palas, which resemble lightning flashes of swift activity, a collection of commentarial notes, which provide a feast for intelligent minds, special miscellaneous works in five parts, which are like a jewel treasure that bestows twofold accomplishment, a collection related to the profound meaning of the perfection stage, which resounds with the splendid music of co emergent wisdom, a collection of pilgrimage guides, like a magical script of wondrous virtue and goodness, and a collection of aspiration prayers, which is like an ocean in which to enjoy the splendor of spontaneously accomplishing twofold benefit. And this, this is, broadly speaking, the same structure that's then followed in the later editions, in the sense that they too begin with the biography or the autobiography, and they conclude with aspiration prayers and or verses of auspiciousness, uh, the praises are near the beginning, as are the supplications and so on. So there's variations between editions, but there also appear to be certain conventions that, that, that have to be followed. So Dinga Kinsarimche says he was aware that this first two-volume edition obviously represented only a small fraction of what Jamin Kinsarimche had actually written, uh, and he noted that uh, Jemin Kinsey had no intention that his writing should ever be compiled. In fact, he usually gave away the original to whoever requested a particular text. And this obviously was a risky thing to do in the days before photocopiers and scanners. Uh, and that is why he says most of the writings from the period of his youth have been dispersed in all directions. And Dingo Kinsey ends the catalogue with a kind of aspiration that th th these other texts from his youth and so on will be discovered and will be published. And so this was the the idea, and this is kind of what's happened because you know you have twenty years later an eight volume edition which has many many more texts, and then uh, thirty years after that you have a twelve volume edition with even more. Um, so obviously here you have exceptional circumstances. You know the turmoil of the late nineteen fifties, the fact that the writings had to be left behind uh, before the journey across the Himalayas. And that made it difficult to compile all the writing straight away. But still, possibly there's some kind of char characteristics to this collection as a whole that have broader application, I think. So what we can say, some features, even in the 2012 edition, not everything by Jim McKinsey is there. And um, obviously in the two volume edition, there are many, many omissions. They, the editors were aware of that. In the six volume edition, still things were missing, but in the 12 volume edition, it's still not everything. And, you know, that's, as we've seen, 
five new texts have come to light uh, since 2012, which will be included in future editions. So, as I've said, there's circumstances of recent decades created exceptional challenges, but there's also probably something about the way that uh, these collections are generally compiled, uh, which means that this is probably always the case, that not everything a master writes is going to be in their collected writings, because generally it seems to be the case that it's after a master has passed away uh, that this happens, they're no longer around to supervise the publication. It's up to disciples to then contribute what they've a copy of what they've received. And it's difficult to contact everyone in, who's received something and things go astray. But um, as I've said already, it, the, even in the 2012 uh, edition, unfortunately, there are things that were missed out that were in the first two volume and the, and the second six volume, so eight volume edition. Um, so as an example, we have, you know, in the first two volume edition, there's a, an aspiration that Jamie Kinsey wrote while he was on a train in India, um, which we published on La Sarah House, I think, a week ago, and that's not in the, the later editions. So there's other examples too. Um, this is unfortunate. And then there's the recent discoveries. Um, and then, the, you know, just to say a few words about the recent discoveries, these include um, notes on the, the Dzogchen manual, the Yeshi Lama, that were taken by um, Kempo Nuden when he received these teachings, and um, notes taken by Jamin Kinsey Chikiludra when he received instruction on uh, Longchen Nyingtik from the third Dzogchen, Jimmy Tempenima. So that's the kind of thing that's not been included in any edition. So in, in addition, um, we know that there are texts, when we say not everything by Jamin Kinsey Chukiludra is here, that we know that there are also things that Jamin Kinsey Chukiludra wrote that are in other collections, and they're not included here. So this is probably also something that's generally the case, that you can find examples of, for example, um, verses that he wrote um, of aspiration in, in when texts were printed, you have verses that are written at the end, kind of benedictory verses, and we know of some examples where they're, they're not included in any of, edition of his collected writings. Um, you know, so that's that's to say, not everything still is 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 here. Then not everything here is by German Kinsey Chikilodro. So this is also probably true of most collected writings that. You know, this is sort of the inverse of what we've just said. The, not everything by Jamin Kinsey is here. Not everything here is by Jamin Kinsey. So there are things that are included intentionally, and there are things that may have been included unintentionally, we can say. So, for example, in intentional inclusions of things by other authors, obviously you have the biography, it's by Dingo Kinsirimche, you have the catalogue, that's by Dingo Kinsirimche, that's, that's obvious. In the, so Dingo Kinsirimche wrote the catalogues for the, the first edition, the eight-volume edition. In the case of the 12-volume edition, that was uh, by Pewa Rinpoche. There are... Um, Uh, there are, in addition to the those, there are some texts that are co-authored with with others. Um, behavioral guidelines for monks. Um, some of these texts are, are they have co-authors. Then you also have um, what they've included in the twelve volume edition. They've also included some texts where Jemenkin Sajukadoja just uh, wrote a couple of extra verses at the end of something, and they've put the whole thing in. So the autobiographical prayer by Mipam Rinpoche that. Um, Jamin Kinsey just adds a few uh, verses at the end of that, you put the whole thing there. The similar um, biographical prayer by Jamin Kinsey Wampo for Jangwon Kuntro Lodra Tai. Jamin Kinsey Chiki Lodra adds a couple of verses at the end, that's included. But, you know, so this is just odd individual texts, but more than that, you have entire collections that are not by Jamin Kinsey that are in this. So you have uh, the Red Tara revelation of Jikung Tertan. Um, Ursa Doji, who's, who's depicted there. You, all, that entire collection is included, and the reason seems to be that German Kids Chikiludra helped to compile that. He wrote one or two prayers, but the, the whole thing is there. And you also have the entire um, 
cycle of Buddha Akshobhya from the Longsil Nyingpo, and that seems to be because Jemakins have added one or two texts. And then, in addition, we have this um, this text, which is quite well known uh, now. This is the the clarifying light prophecy, which is well known because of its English translation, not this English translation, but the one by Stephen Aldrich. Um, he called it the light that makes things clear. Uh, and this has been attributed to Jeremy Kinsey Chukadudra himself, but, you know, really what seems to be the case is that he compiled it. We don't know where from. It says from the words of the Buddha, but this, this is not in the Kanjo. It's not... Um, it's not something that you you find anywhere else that we're aware of. It's just this edition of these prophecies, which people think relates to, uh, if not now, then the next uh, few decades, maybe. Um, but I've I've written about this on my own website. I won't go into too many de details here. There are some questions uh, about this, but it's it's included, and then also included with it which I've also translated on the website, are some verses that when it was published, there were some uh, benedictory verses that Jeremy Kinsey definitely did write that went to the end of this. And then you have some other things that are not by Jeremy Kinsey. So you have things like uh, a collection of uh, Vajrakila recitations from Zongsan Monastery. And the editors of the collection know that it's not by Jeremy Kinsey. And they've just said, this is very rare. So we're going to put it here so that it's preserved. So that's another motivation. So the... You know, this may may not be um, such a big deal for, for everyone, but it's just to, to say that you have this collected writings, which includes quite a lot that's not by him, uh, intentionally, it seems. Then you have unintentionally, perhaps, some other things that um, we, do, we just don't know why they're there. Um, so, for example, there's a, a prayer for the long life of the 16th Kamapa, which was written by Sekhi Trichin. That's included. No, I don't know why. Um, there's one by Jemmy Institute, which is right next to it, but they've included one by Sekhi Trichin. In addition, there is uh, a short Guru Yoga text that um, is also attributed to uh, Kempo Gangsha. So I, I think this is an interesting case, and I can't say definitively one way or another what what is true um but we know that this appears in Kempo Gangsha's works where it says composed by Kempo Gangsha and we know that it's in Jeremy Kinsey's works where it doesn't say who who was the author it just says it was composed in response to a request so there's a slight difference in in Jeremy, in the edition in Jeremy Kinsey's writings it says Lama Madril in Kempo Gangsha, it says Lama Madri. If we could find out who this Lama was, then that might answer the question as to, you know, which collection this really belongs in. But we don't know. It's a, a short Guru Yoga. It's, you know, considered very profound. It's uh, called something like the um, Assembly of Blessings or the something like that, the uh, Chinnabdupa. And it's we have it at the moment on the Tower House. We have one translation in the German Kinsey Chukiludra collection, and we have one in the Kempo Gansha collection, and, you know, who knows where it really belongs. At the moment, we can't say. Um, I, I I won't say which, I think. Okay, and um, so this, this is just to give some kind of overview of the different collections as they exist, and, um, you know, roughly what's, what's in them. Um, in translation, uh, then we have, um, in 1977, Michael Aris was the first to translate uh, something called The Essence of All Vehicles, um, which is a survey of different Tibetan Buddhist lineages and practices. And that is possibly, you could say, Jemin Kinsey most famous work. And it's been translated at least three times since then. Um, including one version by Zonso Kinsaramche, and we also have a version on Lotso House as part of this project. So that was a well-known work. And then you have obviously the the major biography by Dingo Kinsaramche, which is included in the 2012 edition, and the um 
the eight volume edition. And you have a few maybe uh, sadhana texts, some prayers which have been translated uh, over the years by different Dharma groups. Um, but he's, as we've seen, um, if you go back to the uh, overview, you see there's in the 2012 edition, there's more than 1,400, uh, sorry, 1,042 texts. It's much more than that, I think, but that's for sure there's more than 1,040 individual texts. So our translation project at Lotau House um, began in 2019, and so far we've translated 390 shorter texts. And this is part of um, a sort of, the aspiration was four year phase one of the project to translate 500 shorter texts, including the autobiography and the, the catalogs and, and a few more important texts, but, um, you know, that was the idea. So already we've translated uh, texts on a wide variety of different themes and belonging to different genres. And um, you can see from the German Kids Educator page uh, on the website that this includes works of advice, some in prose, some in verse, texts on the arts and the crafts, including one on the proportions of stupas, uh, aspiration prayers, verses of auspiciousness, behavioral guidelines for various monasteries, benedictory verses in the printer's colophons to various texts, biographies, including two autobiographies, and notes on the lives of major figures in the history of Sikkim, texts on Prasangika Madhyamaka philosophy, songs of calling the guru from afar, or Lama Jangbu, Commentaries, Dharma protected liturgies, Dzogchen instructions, empowerment rites, texts on Gesa, prayers to Guru Padmasambhava, Guru Yoga, Guru Sadhana te texts, including the famous Ningtik Saldran, which he composed uh, at the behest of um, Princess Yudran of uh, Dege and Nangchen. Historical works, including royal genealogies of Dege and Sikkim inscriptions which appeared on the back of tanka paintings, letters including one to the Dalai Lama at the time of his meetings with Mao in Beijing, lineage prayers, long life prayers, longevity practices or tzedrup, notes on the seven points of mind training in Lojong, pilgrimage guides and praises to pilgrimage sites in Tibet, India and Nepal, praises to various deities and major figures from India and Tibet, supplications, the clarifying light prophecy uh, that he compiled, um, various sadhanas, songs including a number of laments which he composed when recalling his own teachers, swift rebirth prayers or nyojan sodat, and liturgies for tzok or gana chakra feast offering. And one characteristic of, of all these writings is that the, the average length of them is very short. Uh, so the average length of any text, I think you could say, in uh, even in the 2012 edition, is probably just one or two folios, so very short. And this was a factor <laughs> in deciding to translate them. Uh, it's helpful when you're creating a, a kind of virtual library to have lots of short texts on different topics and different genres, because that helps you structure everything and uh, all the categories and subcategories. And this these writings were uh, ideal for that reason and for other reasons too, but that was a factor. And, um, you know, it's also, there's variation between Tibetan authors, you could say, in how much information they provide at the end in a colophon of a text. And um, of course, uh, colophons also often change between editions. Um, sometimes they're lost altogether, but, um, not everyone writes the time and the place when the text was composed, but German Kinsetriculator's writings generally, they do provide that kind of information, which is um, obviously very useful. Um, and he'll say even who requested the text and you know if there was someone or what inspired it. Sometimes it's ins a text is inspired by a dream or sometimes even by what he's reading. Um, so this is, you know, this makes these writings more interesting, perhaps, than uh, some others. So to look in, in more detail, then, at some of the um, translations that we've 
produced in this this first phase. Uh, if we start with this one, so this is a short supplication or a prayer to the Sakya Lama Jamyang Jiaotsen, who lived from 1870 to 1940, and is, is known sometimes simply as Jamgyal. Mm. Uh, he was the third Kempo at uh, Zongsa's Kamshe Shetra, which um, German kids the founded. So this text is only 12 lines long, uh, and it appears twice in the 2012 edition with different colophons, different notes at the end. So one, vo one version appears in the praises section, and there a note simply says that it was composed at the request of German Gelsen's disciples. Then an identical text uh, appears in the supplication section with this heading and a different colophon. And this specifies that the text was composed on this occasion when uh, German Gelsen gave the oral transmission for the collected writings of, as it says, the omniscient king of Dharma's 13 volumes. That means Gorampa Sonam Senge. So there's no date in the colophon, but we know that this transmission took place in 1926. And um, that means when German Kinsey Chukulura was only 34, that makes it one of the earliest known compositions that we have by him. There are earlier, but one of the earliest. And this supplication is of some historical interest, not least because it contains what appears to be the only record of German Gelsen's full name, which was uh, German Gelsen Jampa Baldenjero. So the, the syllables are highlighted of his name. But more important than that is um, it's of interest because of the event that it com commemorates, because this transmission of Gorampa's collected writings uh, was a very significant moment in the history of Tibetan um, education, you could say, for the Sakya school especially. And it marked the culmination of a quest, a long quest to collect and publish these writings um, by Jemin Gelsen. He'd been the one to do this. And this was um, something that was uh, notoriously difficult, that involved a lot of obstacles. Um, the, the process of, of uh, bringing this to completion saw uh, all kinds of things happen, like a kempo being crushed by a um, collapsing temple. One of the person, one of the people responsible for carving the wood blocks went mad and threw himself in a river. All kinds of things happen. But, um, and of course, the, the most important thing being that these writings had been effectively banned. Um, by the, the government in Lhasa. Uh, and what also makes this interesting, so the, you have the fact that it was so difficult and such an achievement to collect the writings in the first place, but also uh, this was a very controversial thing for, for German Gelsen to be doing, to give this oral transmission for these writings, for the reason uh, that was uh, expressed by Pabonka Techen Ningpo, which is that there was no lineage for these this reading transmission. Um, not surprising because the writings had been you know, suppressed. Um, but uh, Abonka said, you know, this uh, he objected to this, and and he said this these writings, which he uh, thought were a mass of faulty explanations and egregious statements and so on, uh, that you know this the transmissions were being performed when there was no uh, unbroken lineage. And we know, we know that that's true um, because Dejun Rinpoche, in his biography of German Gelsen, he, he explains that uh, the, the transmission lineage for the tantric writings of Gorampa existed, but the, for the philosophical writings, they, it no longer existed. And that Jamgyal therefore uh, used an instruction that's preserved in the compendium of sadhanas and according to that, you, you, there's a method for restoring a broken transmission where um, there's a statue of the Buddha and a Lama with whom you have a connection stands behind the statue and, and they read or sits behind it and they read the text aloud three times. And you imagine that the words are coming from the Buddha himself. And then at the end, the Lama says something like, uphold this, read this, disseminate it widely to others. And this is a tradition which apparently goes back to Sechen Kunga Ningpo. And um, 
this was what happened in the case of Jim Gelson, and um, you know, it's, it's it's said they even did this twice, and then he was able to pass on uh, the transmission, which he did to um, many of the Kempos who taught at Songsa, and and uh, you know, they spread from there. So this is just a, a twelve line uh, prayer supplication, um, you know, but it's what underlies it is is kind of an interesting, uh, complicated history, let's say. Um, involving all kinds of controversy and questions of authority, legitimacy, and all kinds of strategies for negotiating that. Another text that we published as, as part of this first phase is, is this one, A Sun to Banish the Darkness of Wrong Views. Um, and if we consider the, the text that... Um, I mentioned earlier that was translated in 1977, which is perhaps the, the most famous text by German Kinsey Chukulaj, which was um, translated first in 1977 by Michael Aris. Michael Aris said at that time that um, that work synthesized the Rime movement, um, the movement of non-sectarianism. And sometimes when people discuss Rime, they, they talk about it as if it was uh, a 19th century phenomenon. But you know, if we if we do talk about a remain movement, then I think we have to say that it was founded in the 19th century and it definitely continued and it continued into the 20th and beyond. And it was in the 20th century, we could say, that it faced its first real opposition from people who didn't like it. And that's going back to um Pabonka de Ningpo. Pabonka de Ningpo objected to uh the Rime, and he was someone who advocated a kind of exclusivist form of uh, the Gelug lineage. And um, he said that the only, only that approach is valid and all other traditions of, of Tibetan Buddhism lead essentially just to the hell realms. Uh, and he was especially critical of uh, Dzogchen. So this text, you know, it actually is a response to Pabonka and uh, his views. So we can, by reading this, we can, we can see what he, he objected to, because we don't, I mean, we do have some text by him that, that that's, uh, mentioned the kind of things that, that he was objecting to, but this is a, a kind of defense. So from this, we can see uh, the kind of thing. So, you know, he, he German Kinsey Chukulur mentions in this Padmasambhava, He's, he's defending Guru Padmasambhava, saying he's uh, someone who was uh, later reincarnated as Atisha. He's defending the, the Terma tradition. Within the, he says there are parallels for it within the Giluk school. Uh, he speaks about uh, figures in the Nyingma, sorry, in the Giluk lineage who received and practiced Nyingma teachings, including uh, Tsongkhapa himself. He points out these parallels to the Tema tradition. He defends practices like carving mantras, sata tablets, prayer flags, prayer wheels. All these must have been the kind of things that um, were being objected to. And even the 49-day the period um, after a person's death when practices were done uh, and the seven-day rites, this is another thing that must have been seen as controversial. And he also um, defends the, the mantra of Padmasambhava, the man mandala of the peaceful and wrathful deities, and so on. So, I mean, this, we know that this is a response to Pabonka Deshi Ningpo, who I've mentioned, but, you know, that wasn't put, put as clear as it could have been until this text was edited. So, you know, don't worry if you don't, don't read Tibetan. Um, this is just to, to point out that the when we went through this for the translation, Alexander Karimche edited the Tibetan and made it much more clear. He said it was definitely, uh, the version in the 2012 edition was definitely wrong, and that this is definitely a, a clear reference to Paponka, and he made it more clear. Um, and he also, for those of you who do read Tibetan, you can see that he sort of, in the process, he stripped um, Paponka from uh, his title of being learned or a scholar or something. Um, <laughs> Uh, but anyway, so this is another more interesting text on non-sectarianism, uh, but it seems to be a direct response to Pabonka's 
antipathy to to Nyingma tradition, which you know is something that, that there's talked about a lot, but there haven't been many um, many examples of it in in literature. But this is a good clear source of that. Okay, so that's another text. Then um, the third and final example of these these texts from uh, the translations. This is uh, verses in praise of Calcutta. So we know when Jeremy Kinsey left uh, Zongso Monastery in 1955, he passed through Tibet. He reached Sikkim in late 1956. And then, you know, and on the way he composed praises for all the sacred places in Tibet that he visited. He did that again in, in India and Nepal when he went on pilgrimage. He went on pilgrimage twice, in fact, um, to Bodhka, for example. And he also composed praises of places places like Yanglisha in Nepal and um, Sanat as well in India, as well as Bodhka. But he also composed a praise of Calcutta uh, called the Great Indi in praise of the Great Indian city of Calcutta. And this, he says in the text, was an expression of his wonder at um, what he encountered there. And you know, to understand something of the the sense of wonder, we can consider that at that time. Calcutta had a population of around 5 million. And um, if you contrast that with the population of Lhasa, at that time was, uh, you know, 50, 60,000 residents, maybe. So 100 times larger. And Jeremy Kinsey's feelings of wonder at the sights and sounds uh, of uh, Calcutta are expressed in traditional terms. So as in some of his other writings, he refers to Indian Hindu mythology. So he refers, for example, to the etymology of Calcutta as a field or a grove of the goddess Kali. And the praise also speaks about um, the treasure vaults of Vaishravana, Indra with his thousand eyes, the languages of the Kumbanda and the Gandharva, and so on. But he also combines that with a, a display of uh, erudition through metaphor. Um, so he he combines that display of erudition with metaphor, sorry. So he he's compares the swarms of people to bees in search of nectar. The vehicles and their engines roar like thunder. Boats sparkle like stars and seem to have been deposited by the river. Electric lights shine like jewels. All the wares and produce on display in the markets and the shops appear to have been magically emanated through a bodhisattva's prayers of aspiration. And the whole scene is like something from the Deva realm, mysteriously transported to or made visible upon the earth. But the greatest wonder for German Kinsa Chikadura was the opportunity to view the Buddha's relics or ring cell, he says. And so this is presumably a reference to uh, the contents from the stupa at Birdpur in Uttar Pradesh, which were discovered in 1898 and then uh, placed in Calcutta's Indian Museum. The colophon doesn't say which year this was um, that he, he wrote this, but we think it was most likely 1958. Um, so here you have an example of Jemin Kinsey at the juncture between ancient and modern. He's responding to the modern city by means of ancient references. He's interpreting the sights and sounds of the Indian city through poetic convention and reference to ancient mythology. And this encounter with elements of the modern world was definitely a feature of Jemmy Kinsey life more generally and the lives of his contemporaries. And you can see this from his diaries where, where it, it's recorded all the trips that he took by rail and by car and what appeared even to be occasional visits to the cinema. And, you know, another example, we know um, that Jemmy Kinsey was amongst the first Tibetan lamas to be photographed. Um, and this is not simply a question of when the technology first appeared in Tibet, because as Ogi and Tokyo Ramche said, uh, there was a real reluctance on the part of some lamas, including two of his main teachers, uh, Lote Wangpo and Shishin Jasa, to be photographed because they believed cameras were dangerous. But Kinsi Chikadudra doesn't appear to have had any qualms about that himself, and he embraced this technology and posed for a great many photographs, as you can see some of them here, over the course of more than 30 years. And many of these then became objects, uh, highly sought after objects of devotion. 
in addition to that, um, German Kinsetjukenlutter was amongst the first Tibetan lamas certainly to teach with the aid of a microphone and um, to be recorded and to be broadcast on the radio. Um, that um, recording has not survived, unfortunately. But this photograph is probably from 1958, most likely Kalimpong, possibly Bodhgaya. So there are hundreds of texts, obviously, by German Kinsetjukenlutter still to be translated. Uh, including the secret biography and his diaries, but perhaps this brief survey highlights some of the broader issues uh, that his writings touch upon directly and indirectly. The process of compiling the collected works, their evolution over time, the nature of transmission, sectarian conflict, in, and non-sectarianism in the 20th century, responses to modernity as well. And can we say anything more generally about the way collected works are compiled and the types of texts they include? I, th I think we can, as I've said, there are exceptional circumstances here. Um, for example, Jeremy Kinsey could only take a few treasured possessions with him when he left Songsa. He hoped to return to Tibet. It's said that he left many things behind in Tibet before he went across the Himalayas to Sikkim and so on. But some of the features uh, of Jeremy Kinsey's writings do apply elsewhere. For example, it's often the case it mostly seems to be the case that collected writings are only compiled after a master has passed away, and this makes it likely that there will be things that are missed out. And it's not unusual for things to be misattributed. It's common for further texts to be discovered after a collection has been published. Jermyn Kinsey was among the last Tibetan masters to have what we might call a traditional collected works, and is useful to contrast his writings with that of his main student, Dingo Kinsirimchi, who, as I've said, belongs, in a sense, to the same direction, same generation, and also to the subsequent generation. Um, in the case of Dingo Kinsirimchi, in addition to 25 volumes of writings, um, you have several audio, video recordings, and these have, have been the basis for published translations. So these must be considered part of his collected works or his sungbom in the broadest sense. So this is a generational distinction. And then the current generation includes filmmakers, people teaching live on the internet, and so on. And in this sense, Jemmin Kinsey was a transitional or a bridging figure. He was at the center of a vast network of lamas belonging to multiple lineages and schools. And it's this vast network of con connections that makes him such an important figure. Um, and that makes his writing so fascinating. Indeed, the overarching theme of his life and work, I think you could say, is connection. In his autobiography, he speaks of receiving teachings as making Dharma connections. He made Dharma connections not only with his own teachers and students, but also with deities, lineage masters, and other figures through his writings and through his meditative practice, and with places through visiting them and through writing about them. And in turn, people sought to make a connection with him through seeking audiences, through photographs, and through requesting various texts. So he exemplified non-sectarianism through these connections, which extended to multiple lineages and traditions. He also helped to connect as a bridge between generations. And he continued in this way, the Rime ideal of Jemin Kinsey Wampol and Jemgon Kongtrul and ensured its survival in the face of new challenges. And that's, after all, the function of lineage. For Lotzauer House, this theme of connection makes him an ideal figure to focus on at the heart or the hub of our website. And hopefully this in turn provides an opportunity for you and for others to make a connection of your own. Thank you. Thank you so much, Adam, for your wonderful talk. Thank you. And uh, yeah, if anybody has questions, you're welcome to uh, unmute yourselves, or I think there's even a way of raising your hand or something. I don't know how it works exactly, but you can just unmute yourself and ask. I saw that in the comment sections, Connie was asking if there's any way that you would be able to share those pictures, those wonderful pictures that you showed just a few slides ago. Mm. If Maybe they're up on your website. Some of them I've seen online, but not all of them. Yeah. 
Um, okay, I mean, we'll, we'll see. I have to check, you know, sometimes there's, there's copyright issues I, I need to check on there, but of course, you know. Uh-huh, okay, cool. And I see a question just came in in the chat. Do you see it over there, Adam? Um, the one from Han? Yeah, exactly. Um, could you say a little bit more about the new text, the Sartop, since it seems some are really just personal notes and some seem, and some like the notes from Tempinima seem incomprehensible. I mean, you know, this is from someone who's actually read them themselves. So I, I don't know what more I can say. I mean, yeah, this is, you know, what are we going to do with things like this? There's, there's, there are, um, in the 2012 edition as well, you have some of these annotations from um, receiving instructions. And it's really just, you know, this is, I think, you know, what I was mentioning at the end, in, in recent generations, you have audio recordings, you have video recordings. What you have here um, for, for older generations are the notes that people have taken from receiving instructions. And sometimes they don't make a lot of sense, um, you know, for people who weren't there at the time, but still they get published because, you know, there's merit in that. And, and you know, everyone wants to, you know, make these connections with with what's available. But um, yeah, they, they are cryptic. Han knows that very well, I think. And um, we have to decide how we negotiate that. I see another question as well in there in the chat, if you could read it out. I don't know what collection was given in beer in 2011. I do not know that. I have a question for you. You mentioned um, the secret biography. Aside from you, who's working on so many of the texts, is there anybody else who's focusing on translations of the works of Jamaican Zelodro or not? No, I mean, it's it's mainly me that's, that's done the translations, but that some other people, including Han there, um, <laughs> have done some of the translations that, that we've published so far. Um, but, it, it, you know, this first phase, which, you know, the funding for that ends next year, the aim is to do 500 texts, um, and that's just shorter ones. And then there's, you know, for the second phase, that's where you would, you know, hopefully we, we can find people that want to work on things like the secret biography uh there's a there's a shorter version of the secret biography which i think we'll do as you know part of those 500 but um you know these are the the major projects he himself wrote two biographies of his two of his teachers they're quite long um there's the secret biographies an entire volume uh so so there are some longer texts um yeah if, if anyone wants to work on them um <laughs> please be in touch mm. thank you adam i see another question they're asking for advice for learning tibetan i can actually say that sometimes at changchung uk we do have courses of tibetan language i forget now exactly on the yeah, there's one. schedule i think there's one coming up if you look at our website yes. not to do self-promotion it just <laughs> happens <laughs> to be well, that would be my answer anyway yeah something yeah. we do and of course i mean if i can say to mycroft uh there are probably things online depending where you are in the world etc with uh, the pandemic zoom has flourished but we do do some stuff with a professor called fabian sanders if you do want to check out the shangsheng website plus any others that uh, adam might re want to recommend well, I, I, you know, I'm out of touch. I, I think the, the, this other question: Should you start with colloquial or classical or both? Which can be overwhelming. I, you know, I, I think. Ah, uh, that I mean, you know, which one you start with, maybe doesn't matter so much. I think there is an advantage to doing both eventually, um, but you know, maybe what's easiest to start with. Just a point. Uh, Fabian Saunders has just begun teaching again um, and that's on uh, re referred to on the Shangsheng website but it began yesterday <laughs> okay perfect so there'll be uh, more stuff to come on Tuesday get in touch with Margarita if you want to do it I think get in touch with Shangsheng UK thank you I'll send you um, 
maybe an email for the person to call. I think actually it's us, Shang Shung UK organizing it. It's not me that yeah, it's you organizing it. Yeah, we are organizing it. Sometimes we're <laughs> So yeah, we will. I'll send the link on the chat page. Then uh, anybody who's interested can have a look. Yeah, sorry. Any more questions from anyone? I do actually have a question. Um, you mentioned um, a, a text that was being that had been translated by uh, Stephen Aldridge. Yes. Could you just uh, remind me what that text was? Uh, yeah, so, biography, I think, wasn't it? No, this is a, um, a prophecy. I think in Stephen Aldridge's version, he he says that it's by Jami Kenzu Chikadoro. And so, the you know, this is all over the internet as being by Jami Kenzu Chikadoro and being a prophecy um, that is relevant at the moment. And... Um, I I thought I should translate this as part of the first phase um, and look into it in more detail. So I wrote quite a long thing about it on my own website at msprc.com, I think it is. And if you're interested, you could look at that, but I, I wouldn't necessarily recommend it. The point that I'm I'm making there is that this is not, according to Jemmy Kinsey himself, he was compiling it. We don't know where from. And it's, it, it is this series of prophecies um, which has people concerned um, because they think it refers to now, but it's only giving the Tibetan date, you know, things like, you know, the, 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 the iron horse. So it doesn't say which cycle that refers to. So it could be in 60 years time, it could be 120 years time, it could be, you know, there's, there's this 60 year cycle and these dates are given simply with the, the the tibetan date like that but that that itself makes it quite strange because why would um the buddha be using the tibetan calendrical system for these things so we don't you know we don't um there are some questions let's say and it, it may be that uh this material was around before german kenzi chikalodro because there seemed to be all kinds of versions out there and you know in, in which case what was his role um, but, you know, people bring it up because some people thought that it was predicting the pandemic. Uh, so, it, you know, it, you see um, references to it online quite a lot. My, my second question is, do you know how to get in touch with Steve Aldrich? Because he's an old friend of mine. from. Oh, the no, he, he passed away. Um, oh, I wonder I have, on, on my website, I have the dates. I, I don't remember when that was, but um, right. I can hear Edward Henning both gone. Yeah. Someone's put the link in there. I mentioned the text by Michael Aris on the Remain movement. Yeah, so the, the that's um it's a an article um in I think Kailash. So a sort of journal article. It was a translation of this text, which is in verse. Uh, by Jamin Kinsey Chikidlodro, which in the introduction, it's an interesting, you know, M Michael Harris at that point says, you know, I was uh, told to translate this by Dingo Kinsey Rimche, who's my teacher. And, um, you know, and it was published in 1977. Um, and uh, that same text, which is, you know, described as a, a kind of declaration of non-sectarianism by Jamin Kinsey Chikidlodro, his, his most famous sort of summary of the whole of Tibetan Buddhism, all the different lineages, and then a, a plea for non-sectarianism at the end. And there have been um, other translations. There's one by the Library of Tibetan Works and Archives. Uh, there's another translation by Dzongsa Kensu Rimche himself. And then there's a translation on Lhotsa House of the same text. Uh, the, the question about... Um, how realized beings can show fear of mice or consider cameras to be dangerous. I I don't know about that. That's a good question for a llama. That's all I can say. Okay, if we don't have any more questions, which I don't believe we do here, 
then I'd like to thank you so much, Adam. Thank you. And thank you everybody for attending. And we do have more um, talks coming up. Next month, we have a talk about the cult of Gesser, King Gesser in Eastern Tibet, so, and rights connected with it. So this has been a sort of period about Eastern Tibetan masters and topics. And in December, we'll have a talk about the Derga printing press, which was a famous center of learning and culture, which, uh, of course, Jemek and Siwangpu was very much involved with. So the show goes on. Please do follow us. And it's great to see so many of you. Thank you for joining us. And thank you, Adam.